my morning routine goes something like have coffee. That allows me to avoid the yoga and those other things that you needed for your energies. Hi, I'm Anita Smith. I'm Bradley Rice. And, and you're, you're listening, listening to, to the, the Salesforce, Salesforce for Everyone podcast. podcast. In today's show, Anita shares some work hacks that balance efficiency with style. I'll throw on a trailblazer hoodie on top if I'm camera on because 95% of the time I am in my pajamas. Also, Brad discusses the risks behind starting a podcast. It's so nice to go to an event and say, I am the host of the Salesforce for Everyone podcast. And yeah, it can definitely overtake your life if you're not careful. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Salesforce for Everyone podcast. In today's episode, we're actually going to be walking through our top work hacks and tips for Salesforce professionals. In this episode, as always, I have Anita Smith to help deep dive and bring these topics to you. How's it going, Anita? Hey, it's going really well. How about yourself? It is actually going really well. Also, we haven't had anything eventful happen here in the last you know couple of weeks, so I'm thankful for that. And yeah, we don't have any crazy catastrophes on our side. How, how about you? We are preemptively taking down trees that we're worried <laughs> that will fall down so we don't get any surprises. My fiance has been having a fun time with his brand new chainsaw. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Well, that's cool. So I think we have like a, a bit of a topic to cover before we actually cover the topic of this episode. And that's the fact that this is the final episode of season three. And not only is it the final episode of season three, like we had our final episode of season one and season two, we are not planning currently, everything can change, but we are not currently planning a formal season four. So we want to sort of let all the listeners know so that you know, going into next week that number one, there's not going to be an episode next week, but number two, that there's not going to be a formal plan for a big major, you know, 15 episode planned out season four. And the reason for that is that largely we went on this journey, Anita and I, and of course, everybody behind the scenes that produces the show and edits and makes this all a reality. We entered into this journey with a purpose. And the purpose was that we felt like the Salesforce ecosystem was underserved from a podcast perspective, that there are some shows and there's some great shows out there. But there was nothing speaking specifically to career change and transition and entry level individuals and sharing the stories of real life people across the ecosystem and how they had been able to make a career utilizing Salesforce skills. And our goal was to, as you can tell in like episodes one through eight and all of season one, it was all about helping people understand that they can absolutely do this and they can absolutely transition into a Salesforce career. And there are proven steps to make that possible. And we wanted to make sure to have that said. But at the same time, what we didn't want to do was create hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes every single week to just create a mass of content that becomes not navigable, right? Like you can't go through it. You can't find what you're looking for. We didn't want there to be 40 different episodes on LinkedIn branding, right? Because then it becomes impossible to figure out where to start. And we didn't want to create a piece of content that was that cumbersome. So we feel like in these first three seasons, we have said massively what we needed to say and what we needed to communicate to the ecosystem and where we're experts. And again, the last thing we want to do is start talking about things that we don't know about and just trying to share information. So we feel like we've said what we needed to say in that really formal way. We're definitely going to have future episodes, but we're going to bring ideas to you and topics to you as they are meaningful to the community, not just to hear ourselves talk, not just to create another episode, not just to create another season, but to bring meaningful content to the listeners. So from here on out, when you see an episode hit your favorite podcast platform, when you see us announce an episode on LinkedIn or Facebook or any of the user groups, know that that episode is going to be what we consider to be vitally meaningful to the community. And that's the reason why we are creating episodes going forward. So I know that was a long tangent for an intro to a podcast episode, but yeah, any, any thoughts on your side, Anita? No, that was perfectly said. I feel like we've covered the basics and unless there was some big topic we didn't cover, feel free to add that, you know, hit us up on LinkedIn. When you're giving us a five-star rating, you can add that to the, your comment. But yeah, I think we've done a, a very thorough job to get someone started in a Salesforce career. Yeah. And we'll, we'll definitely come back, right? Like 
episodes one through eight, we talked about this at the beginning of season three, that episodes one through eight still hold water, right? They're still on point, at least 95, 97% accurate for what needs to be said. And the moment that's not true, we will absolutely come re-record these topics and make sure that you have the most up-to-date information for these topics. But until that's true, you should reference the ones that are there, right? They're already amazing. They're already right there for you. And we appreciate all of the listeners and, and everyone sharing. And we, we hope you'll continue to share and listen. All right. You want to dive in on uh, work hacks? Yes. Yes. I have quite a few. Um, <laughs> you don't mind. I'll, I'll get it started. Um, get it started. If, if you've listened to some of the previous episodes, you know, one of my biggest weaknesses is time zones. So I have a, a couple of things in place that I do to get over this weakness. And one is I set world clocks on my iPhone. There's a widget and you can have multiple clocks there. So I have teams in India, I have people East Coast, West Coast, all over. So I always have a clock on my phone so I know what time it is. And also for work, we use Outlook and you can go in the calendar and actually add the different time zones there. So that's really helpful as well. And then I don't trust myself. So I always double check and just Google the time differences, especially when it's around daylight savings, because that gets confusing as well. Yeah, that's, I think that's really smart. I have never done that, but I can tell you I do get tripped up on time zones. And I think anyone who's worked with other people in other time zones can attest to the fact that eventually it's going to get you. Like, So get in front of it because the time zone issue is going to get you eventually. I think maybe a decent segue is for me when I'm looking at, I imagine the time zones especially are beneficial for meetings and understanding when you're scheduling things. And one of the tips that I have is scheduling gaps into your meetings, because this is one of my issues is that I'll schedule meetings back to back to back because I'm trying to be efficient. And I love to knock out my meetings in the morning. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about focused work and, and how you can set aside different time blocks for different things. But for me, my mornings, I like to get the meetings out of the way. It's when I have the most energy. It's when I can carry that conversation and keep that focus with other people and not lose track. So one thing that I used to do is just put my meetings back to back to back, like it'd be 10 to 10 30, 10 30 to 11, 11 to 11 30. And inevitably, and we can all again attest to this, the meeting doesn't end at 10 30. There's always some small talk and it carries on for two minutes. And it's probably not a big deal every now and then, but for me and my coworkers, like I don't necessarily want to be two, three, five, eight minutes late to every single meeting. So what I've worked on is scheduling in times where instead of going from 10 to 1030, going from 10 to 1025, or instead of 10 to 11, going from 10 to 1050 and giving that gap, knowing there's going to be overflow. And if there's not overflow, then I've got five or 10 minutes to think about what that next meeting is, get mentally prepared, and then hop in instead of coming fresh out of a rush from one, ending one meeting and jumping into another one to ending one meeting, having that little breather, and then coming into the next one a little bit fresher. So that's another one of the sort of scheduling tips that I think I have. Yeah, I do something similar or Outlook does it automatically for me. I'm not sure if I had set something up or company wide, they'd set something up. But when I go ahead and schedule a 30 minute meeting, it all automatically updates to 25. If it's a 60 minute meeting, it'll update to 55. But what I also like to do, I, I do have back to back meetings in the morning because it's the best time that works for my team that's all over the world. But after those meetings, I make sure to block off time. You can call it focus time or not, but I usually have that blocked off so I can, you know, compile my notes, send out like a, a meeting notes, recap, email, just all the little admin stuff you have to do, but you don't have time to do it. If you have back to back meetings, I'll block off time specifically for that. Another thing I will do, because I've gotten so used to the calendar sound on my phone and my computers, I just kind of like miss them and don't even like, even even the pop-ups that like, like, oh, your meeting starts in 15 minutes. You instantly hit dismiss and then you forget about it. So that happened enough times where I missed the meeting that the day before I will go through my calendar and I will go on my iPhone and go into the alarm setting and set alarms for every single meeting two minutes before. So one, I always get to the meeting like early and on time, which looks great. But two, I've also found that anyone who sets up that meeting really appreciates you getting there on time because 
as you start working remotely, you'll notice a lot of people will show up like exactly on time or like a few minutes late. So it's always nice. You, you can like feel, I guess, I don't know, favors from people just by showing up on time. They like get really excited. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I, th- I think in my work culture, I got to a point where if you were less than five minutes late, you were on time, which I know some people are sticklers. It's like, if you're less than five minutes early, you are late. And for me, it became, if you're less than five minutes late, you're you're still on time. It's fine. But I've also personally never been one of those people who's like crazy micromanagy. Uh, that's about because things. you're the one that's late. <laughs> Be honest. Oh, you're absolutely right. I am always, <laughs> I am always comfortably <laughs> two to three minutes late to everything. That's like a, that's a Hawaii thing, right? Like I need to move to Hawaii and then it'll be more acceptable for me to. Oh, I, island time. That, yeah, yeah. yeah. Island time. <laughs> that's what I need to do. Uh, that's where I need to sit, have all my meetings. So I guess we can stay on the topic of meetings. There's a couple other things we can talk about scheduling uh, meetings. But before that, I actually want to talk about like life during the meeting because it's so funny. We're talking so much about meetings. So I'm going to take a moment to have a tangent about this and then we'll move into the actual meetings. There's one thing I noted about talent stacker alumni when they're landing jobs. One of the first things they notice is that they end up on a lot of meetings and that can be frustrating. I think for a lot of people, because I think we, a lot of times say, well, meetings equals inefficiency, right? Uh, If you just have all these meetings and sometimes that's true for some companies, like they just will meet you to death and it's unnecessary. You're not even sure why you were on the meeting. And that's one thing. And that's totally different than what I'm, I'm going to talk about here. If your company is inefficient and the meetings are worthless, then that, that's not okay. And, and hopefully you can help to impact a change in that culture. And we'll talk a little bit about how to avoid meetings later. But I wanted to talk about the fact that you're involved in the meeting means something. And I try to communicate that to talent stacker alumni when they're getting into these meetings. And they're like, man, I have like five meetings on my calendar today. And I think we can take this and we can say, on one side, we can be resentful, right? But on the other side, we can be really thankful. And the fact that you're being invited to the meeting, the fact that they want your name and your face and your ideas and your thoughts inside of that meeting, it shows a certain level of respect and just appreciation that they have for you. And a lot of people are coming from jobs. When we've been in the Salesforce space, we get frustrated with our meetings. But when you come from a job where maybe previously people were going into the meeting room, and making all the big decisions and then coming out and dictating to you what the results of those meetings were, that's a different level of frustration and a different level of honestly disrespect around your skills and your involvement in the decisions. But the cool thing is, is when you're involved in these meetings, what that means is you are the decision maker. You are a pivotal part of those decisions being made. And to me, I think if you can reframe that for yourself and be a little bit thankful or grateful that you found a position in your career where people respect you so much that they want to make sure that you're involved and that you hear and you get your say because you are a meaningful part of the company. Now, with that being said, now that we're in these meetings, there are a couple things that come up. So the first one we heard uh, on a previous episode, and that is a noise canceling app called crisp.ai, and that's K-R-I-S-P, and no, we're not an affiliate, um, .ai. What this tool does, it's really cool. You can go watch demos. Um, It's fairly inexpensive. But if you're on meetings a lot and you work from home, which a lot of Salesforce professionals do, uh, and you have a lot of background noise, like for instance, sometimes I like to work outside and there can be, you know, for us, there, there could be a train going by, cars going by, you know, a lot of natural noises, sprinklers turning on, all that kind of stuff. Apps like Crisp, and of course, for typical people, loud kids, dogs barking, all that kind of stuff. Crisp actually sounds out all of that. And literally, they're only going to hear your voice when you talk. And otherwise, they're going to hear silence. And you would be surprised at how well uh, that technology actually works. So if background noise is an issue for you, be sure to check out Crisp again with a K. And if you just Google Crisp noise canceling you know, meetings, you're going to find it. Yeah. Do you have any tips for in meeting things that we can do for more efficiency? Yeah, I was going to add, um, I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's called Tactic. It's T-A-C-T-I-Q. And it records the transcript of the meeting. And since GPT has come out, they have add-ons where it'll summarize the meeting and even have an action item checklist as well, which I thought was pretty cool. I think Microsoft Teams actually has it built in or it's coming out to have that 
built in with the transcripts to summarize and action items. This was just the first Chrome extension I saw out there. That makes sense. I'm willing to bet that all those meeting tools, right? Like Google Hangouts and Zoom and Microsoft Teams and everybody's going to incorporate that out of the box. That's going to be a standard feature, you would think, you know, going forward or at the very least upgrade to our pro plan in order to unlock this and this. Yeah, it makes for a nice little boost. Another one that I don't use, but I get the value of are Zoom backgrounds. And I think people, it doesn't have to be Zoom, right? It can be Google or whatever else, add a background. And that can save a lot of time uh, for individuals if you're trying to keep your office clean or you're trying to keep your background prepped or whatever else. It can be really easy, just create background templates. And people get really creative with these. Like you can have the QR code to link to your LinkedIn profile. You can have different branding up. Like if you're an independent contractor or something like that, you could have different branding up for your business or, or your colors for your brand all those different ways that you can differentiate yourself and stand out. And you don't want to be distracting, but you can come up with some really cool professional. I know a talent stacker for all of our live calls. And Anita, you host these. And I know your background's like pretty slick and it's all, it lets people know you're the talent stacker admin host on that Zoom call. It could have 10, 20, 30, 100 plus people on it. Yeah, it's mostly to <laughs> cover up my background. I mean, you guys can't see it right now because you're this is a podcast, but I'm in the garage <laughs> right now and it's real messy back here. But one story someone told me about how they set up their background uh, was really interesting. They were interviewing for a company and then they actually put the company's logo in their background, which was kind of smart. I don't know. It's a, it's a good icebreaker. So there, there's many uses for backgrounds. I always like to keep a background just in case I am traveling and don't want anybody to know. <laughs> but yeah, let me think. I have a couple of meeting tips, not like for during the meeting, if we are ready to move on to another topic. There's a tool I use called Calendly. There's a free version. I think if you only have like two calendars to connect and it, it's awesome. This helps a lot if you're scheduling items outside of work as well. And like you can block time off so people can't schedule times with you. It's just like if you're really involved in the community and you're setting up coffee chats, this tool is really, really helpful to not accidentally schedule something over your work calls. So that's one tool. This other tool I like to use is to avoid unnecessary meetings. My tech lead, he was giving me advice one day on like how to think about when I'm setting up meetings because I'm a scrum master. So I set up a lot of meetings. He's like, make sure you think about like how many people are in the meeting, you know, how much like they get paid. And then you, you add that up to how much that meeting actually costs the company. Like, is it really necessary to have everyone there? Is it necessary to have a meeting? Because that's an expensive meeting to have. And that's really helped me rethink who I invite or if it needs to be a meeting at all, if it can just be an email. So this next tool I use is called Scribe How. And sometimes people want to like jump on a call, like they need instructions on how to do stuff. This prevents you from jumping on call. This allows you to just do it on your own time. It'll record what steps you're doing on your screen and it'll write it out. It'll have pictures and then it'll have circles in the pictures of where you clicked. And it'll be step-by-step instructions that just you do it, it writes it out for you. And then you can go in and edit and then share the link. I absolutely love that tool. Do you have anything you use? Yeah, I do. And you know, you were telling me a little bit about that tool before the show, and that was completely new to me. It's still new to me. I just know a little bit about it now. And it sounds really similar, but also considerably different than a tool that I use called Loom. And we've mentioned like Zoom backgrounds. I usually don't use a Zoom background, but it is a tip and it is extremely beneficial to, you know, a lot of individuals. But this one I do use. Loom I use definitely on a weekly basis, almost on a daily basis, I would say. And to Anita's point, it is a meeting avoidance, right? Like you can get out of meetings by using this, especially if you're in a Salesforce role, which I think most everyone listening is or will be very soon. And what it allows you to do is record videos quickly, right? Like you can screen share, but basically it just creates a recording. So say that you just created something in Salesforce and you needed to show someone how it works real quick. Well, you can just do a screen record and then send them the link. Or if there was something like a click path, they needed to go down, like click the setup menu and then go to objects and then click fields or whatever, right? And instead of having to 
get on a screen share and show them or an end user that needs training on how to add a field to a report or whatever else. Like you can create all this stuff instantly. And so many times when people think I need to share my screen, this would be easier if I share my screen, they schedule a meeting and they're just like, I just need to screen share and then I can show you. And it's unnecessary because they could easily just open Loom. There's no need for anyone to have to block off their calendars or go back and forth for four emails about who's got what time available and then referencing your time zones and all that kind of stuff, right? You could just record a quick Loom, say, this is what I see on my screen, and then send that over. And the cool thing is it doesn't like store the video to your desktop, where then you have to like upload it to a folder and share it or something like that. It's all cloud-based. So it instantly records. It's instantly right there on the cloud. And as soon as you're done with that, it automatically creates a link. As soon as you stop recording, it automatically creates a link. And you can just hit reply in your email. Here's a quick video about how to do XYZ, paste. And they instantly have access to that video. And I try to train the people I work with to Loom videos back and forth so that we can be asynchronous, go back and forth. We can shoot each other, you know, two or three videos throughout the day about different things. And that makes it really easy to avoid blocking up your calendar or not being able to go out for lunch with your family or not being able to, you know, grab that extra cup of coffee that you need to push through the day because you have another meeting coming up back to back to back. Yeah, I really enjoy these tools for effectively meeting avoidance. All right. So, I mean, I feel like that's a great start. I will say one one more tip for my end for meetings is wear a hat. Like, I feel like for me, I always wear a hat. And if you're ever worried about the way your hair looks or if you're ready, you can like get a hat made for the company you work for. If they don't already have hats at the company, just get a hat made with their logo on it. And I can pretty well guarantee you nobody's going to bust you for it. In fact, they're probably going to be like, where'd you get that company hat? And that's going to allow you, if you're comfortable in a hat like I am, then life hack. Like you do not need to spend the 10 minutes getting your hair to look a certain way in the morning. Like put a hat on, call it a day and brand your business all at the same time. I must say like that is one of the biggest life hacks I have picked up from you. I am not a hat person except when I'm on these Zoom calls or any, any calls because I don't know. I I guess I have let myself go a little bit working from home. So <laughs> there's, it's not look like routines for women. Like when I had to go to the office, like there's a lot of makeup and stuff and you had to make sure your hair looked right. I have not worn makeup in a very long time. I just like throw a hat on. I didn't even like brush my hair this morning. <laughs> that's awesome. I think that's great. Like, honestly, it was, for me, it was as soon as I started creating content for like YouTube, like years ago, I would have to fix my hair. And I'll tell you what, fixing my hair is one of my pet peeves. Like, it's so annoying and it always takes longer than it should. And it's like, why doesn't it just do what it's supposed to do? And I was like, I'm just going to put a hat on and that's going to be the end of it. And you'll see like in my early YouTube videos, it was, I just bought a Salesforce hat off of like the Trailblazer store and I wore a Salesforce hat and I was like, it's on brand, right? I'm talking about Salesforce. It's a Salesforce hat. But I can tell you that the unexpected benefit of this is that, you know, people put like the little watermarks in their content and they've got like their logo down at the bottom right or whatever all the time. Like I've got a logo on my head all the time. Like if I go out in public and I put a hat on if I do a live video or if I create content for TikTok or YouTube or anything else, it's all always branded. So it's amazing. You can be doing anything and always, you know, marketing your content at the same time. That's so smart. Now I'm going to go make a hat for my new company. I need to unbox so I can brand it. I have to tell you, and, and two, this is not a benefit for everyone, but I got to say, so I'm doing a brand deal with Salesforce right now, like the company, right? And so they wanted me to create some TikTok videos. So I am. And the funny thing is, is they're going to reuse that content. They're going to repurpose that content in other ways. That's the whole thing about like smart companies when they want you to like, hey, make a video for us and we'll shout you out and we'll build up your brand. Well, my brand is wearing this hat. So it would be very weird for me not to wear this hat in a video. Like that would almost be odd to the audience, like something. No one up. would recognize you without the yeah, hat. Yeah, it'd be so weird. So it's funny because Salesforce wants to promote a piece of content. And by default, they're also, if they repurpose that content for anything in the future, they're also going to be sharing my brand out into their space, which is honestly one of these unexpected major benefits of just wear your brand on your head and you're good to go. Unless they're listening right now and make you re-record everything without that. Don't you do it. Don't you do it, Salesforce. 
another pro tip because I I'm usually like I guess it's like the work version of a mullet. I'm usually like pajama clothes underneath and I'll throw on a trailblazer hoodie on top. And as a Salesforce professional, that is professional attire. So um, I will always do that if I'm camera on because 95% of the time I am in my pajamas. All right, let's see. Um, I'm trying to like do a smooth segue from pajamas (laughs) and my other work hack of having a morning routine. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. Let's do it. That sounded like a great segue to me. What's your morning routine like, Anita? Wow. Thank you for asking. So <laughs> I just restarted this morning routine again and like my energy and everything is much better. I don't know why I fell off the morning routine wagon, but the one I use is it's from a, a book I read, which someone on a coffee chat sent to me. It's called uh, Miracle Morning. And they have uh, these steps you use. I think the acronym is SAVERS. So I don't think I actually do all of them. But what I do for my morning routine for now until (laughs) I let it drop off again is I'll I'll meditate, which I use an app to help me do that. I will read a book, not a whole book, just a couple of pages (laughs) or a chapter or something, a good stopping point. I have like a a gratitude journal. So I share what I'm grateful for every day. I have like an affirmations app. So it's a lot of feel good stuff that I say out loud in the morning. And then finally, I'll practice yoga in the morning, which I think is like the biggest thing. I had taken a big pause on exercise. And I could definitely tell the difference, like even the past couple of days, since I've started practicing yoga again, my energy is higher, like I need less caffeine, and I, I don't crash in the afternoon anymore. And my head is super clear now, now that I've started working out again. But yeah, that's pretty much my morning routine. How about you? Do you have one? (laughs) Do I have a a morning routine? Yeah, (laughs) Uh, I do have one. I can't say it's nearly as thought out (laughs) as your routine is. Uh, My morning routine goes something like have coffee that allows me to avoid the yoga and those other things that you needed for your energies. I just get mine <laughs> from my coffee. But I will say that I do like getting outside in the morning and I can kind of see the comparisons between like quiet time and that meditation and that ability to like ground yourself. It is a quiet time with myself and it's forced because we've got the animals now, right? And we just got goats last week. I guess that could have been an update. And so the- wait, um, wait. Can I borrow your goats? Because I have a lot of poison ivy growing on my trees and I know they love eating that. <laughs> I, I guess. It, the funny thing is like, I don't know a lot about them yet. They're dairy goats and we're going to be in a routine where we have to milk them or at least we should milk them a few times a week. So I'm excited about all that. But back to morning routine, it allows me to get outside and I have to, right? Because if you don't store the chicken feed at night, then mice will get into the chicken feed. So the chickens don't have food until I go out there in the morning and they free range. So they're locked in their cages until we open the doors in the morning. And so every morning you get to go for a little walk and and see some animals that are very pleasant to see and they're doing their thing and they're appreciative that you're feeding them and giving them water and letting them out. And then just hanging out and seeing them for a little bit. And usually I'll check the gardens and water them if I need to. And it makes for a very, I would say, again, very comparable to just getting grounded, having a second for my thoughts, and then coming back to the house and finishing that cup of coffee and and really letting the input from the family and our daughter and it's time for work. And, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I don't think about work when I'm doing my morning routine, right? Like when I'm out there in the garden, I'm definitely thinking about what is it that I need to accomplish today and this week in order to scratch that uh, ability to be productive, like scratching that productivity itch that I, I definitely have. So do I have a morning routine? Yeah, for sure. But definitely not as intentional as your morning routine. Well, I mean, this is just the start. I did leave out one part. It's so hard for me to break out of this habit. But when I'm like, still laying in bed before I'm actually getting up, I will look on social media. I just can't help myself. It's a hard one to break. That's interesting you bring that up because out of the blue, I just one day decided and my wife was super on board. We used to keep our phones beside our bed. And what we decided to do is just put them in the bathroom, right? Like it's still there, but we can't reach them. And so we can still hear our alarms when they go off in the morning to wake us up. Um, We don't have alarms right now. And I'm very thankful for that. It was for school season for Evelyn. We had to have alarms and we don't have to have them right now, which is amazing. But we had them away from us because I was getting in that habit of 
just picking it up uh, right before I went to bed too, and just checking to see if there's anything major. And it would sometimes like make me spiral because I would get to thinking about whatever it was that I saw and I needed to think about it. And it's just not important. I can wait until tomorrow. And to your point too, having to walk into the next room, not being able to be in like that groggy sleepy mode when I pick up my phone and having to at least be in some level of alert mode. Because when I get in that groggy mode and I pick up my phone, like time just goes by because I have less energy and less of that intention to be like, okay, that's enough. We move along and I'll just get stuck on, you know, socials or something like that. All right. Want to talk about another tip? Yeah. Okay. Do you have one in mind or do you want me to like push into something? Uh, I was going to try to segue the automation one because... Segue that automation. I know I've suggested before, but you like waking up early and letting the chickens out, but you can automate the doors <laughs> to let the chickens out and like automate the closing doors at night. But anyways, you should try to automate everything. I have like so many templates I you reuse just so I don't have to recreate things. As a scrub master, I'm always like facilitating meetings. So I'm always taking meeting notes. So we use Confluence. So I, you can create different like buttons in there. So I actually have buttons for the different types of meetings we have. And I just click create meeting note and it'll open up to a template specific to that meeting. So I don't have to refill everything out, which is extremely helpful. Yeah. When you can automate it, just do it. It saves so much time. I'm a big fan of templates, even like agenda templates and emails. Like I, I use reoccurring meetings a lot instead of just creating a meeting each time, especially if it, if it happens every two weeks. I think you're right. And it tends to come naturally, at least I think maybe I'm wrong. As people work in the Salesforce ecosystem, we talk a lot about automating business processes, right? And so if you're paying attention in your life and you're not completely burnt out and inundated with the day-to-day, -day, you'll probably start thinking about how can I be more efficient? And you start implementing those automations into not just your work life, but honestly, for me, it's been into other aspects of life. And a lot of things in life are automated, right? Like we already have coffee machines where we just click go, um, toss a pot in and click go, or you, you have an alarm that automatically wakes you up at the right time. And sometimes people have alarms that tell them when to go to bed and when to turn their phones off and all this kind of stuff. Like a lot of our lives, we do rely on technology to automate them already. And then there's so much technology being introduced into homes and these smart homes and, you know, automating lights turning on at certain times or off at certain times. Or if you have a pool, like that whole situation is automated. Like you can imagine how much of that was manual. And now suddenly all these things we, we take for granted are, are, automated our lawns being watered and having people on a schedule to, you know, if you pay for someone to cut your grass, those kind of things. So yeah, I think it's very natural to, if you're finding things at work, especially that are just mundane and you're doing it over and over and over again, even if it's end user requests where they're constantly sending you the same type of request over and over and over, I would, I would argue, take a moment on like Friday to look back at what people have been emailing you about Monday through Thursday and what they've been asking you about and see if you can find a pattern where it's the same kind of stuff that's taking up your time. And if you can find that pattern, then there's probably a good chance that you could use a tool to help alleviate that. Or you could do some training documentation or standard operating procedures that could help those users to help themselves instead of you having to help them all the time. So always working those efficiencies in, I think serve you as a professional and they, they serve you as a individual as well. So you can focus time on the things you enjoy, but remember, do not go fill that time up. The time that you save, don't go fill it up with the next thing without being very intentional about it. Like be okay having downtime and free time. And if you want to fill that time up, <laughs> be intentional about it. How do you do that? I have trouble with that. I, I think sometimes you have to get burned enough times, right? Like you've got to get in that position where there's so, where, where you have your meltdowns and you have your burnouts and you go, I'm at overwhelm, like I've met overwhelm. And I think a lot of times we want to blame our employers or our coworkers or our jobs or our spouses, unfortunately, or our kids or whatever else. Like we blame everything. And I think most of the time you can turn around and if you need somebody to blame, blame yourself because that's probably an accurate outcome of the situation. And that's okay. It's okay for us to be wrong and for us to be at fault. And I don't think it really matters who's at fault. What, what matters is the solution and, and finding a positive outcome. But yeah, I, I think a lot of times you just learn from being burned enough and not wanting to go back to that overwhelmed place in your life. 
And I think a lot of times in life, the pressure that we feel is pressure we place on ourselves. Like that's not always true. Some people, you know, legitimately are in bad situations or maybe health situations that they literally couldn't have prevented. But there, I think most things for most people day to day in life, all the stress that we feel is self-induced and we don't actually have like a manager breathing down our neck or a team that would you know, fire us. Like we're always worried about being fired. We talked about this a little bit in the last episode. Like we think the end result is being fired, but it's not like you can push back on deadlines and you can say, I overextended and I thought I could get this done by Friday, but I just can't. And it's okay to say that. Don't say that when you're 60 hours into the work week, right? Say that when you're 30 hours into the work week and going, Hey, I don't think this is going to fit into the next 10 hours. I should probably send somebody an email instead of staying up all night and making it work, I should probably send somebody an email and let them know it's not going to get done by Friday and be apologetic and let them know that you overextended and this is on you, but it's going to be next week. And that's got to be okay because work is only part of your life, not your life. That's my rant on that. So I think that makes sense to move into setting boundaries, right? Like we could, yeah, we can move into some boundary settings. Perfect. I know this is crazy difficult. I'll let you talk about setting boundaries at work, if you don't mind. And yeah. I want to talk about setting boundaries with community after you go into that. Ooh, yeah, I need help with that one. All right. So for work boundaries, this is something important that you should do when you're first starting a new job or first starting out with a new team is from the very beginning, don't start answering the emails or take any calls or respond to any instant messages outside of work hours. I work remote, so I'm like sometimes out and about or around my house. So I do have like my Teams messenger or Teams app on my phone, but I will set it so I don't get any notifications outside of work hours. It's just important not to respond because you're setting that expectation like, okay, they don't respond after work hours, so I'm not going to expect them to respond or I won't even bother asking them. Let me ask someone else who's still working. That's one thing. And then also when you take your first vacation, don't respond to anything either. Make it clear. I make it super clear to my team. Like, hey, I don't even have cell service where I'm going. So I will always send out an email before I go on vacation. I'll make sure I hand things off to people. But in the email, I'm like, I will list, you know, who's covering me for this, this, this. If something needs to be escalated, this is who you need to email. I'll have specific instructions. And then aside from that, along with the automation thing, I have a daily alarm at five o'clock every day just to remind myself to stop working and also to set my alarms for tomorrow. So it kind of closes out my day, just making sure like I don't have to think of anything for tomorrow because I'm already setting alarms and prepping myself for tomorrow. Yeah, I think that's excellent. Yeah, anytime we can set those boundaries and it goes back to like we we have ourselves to blame. You can point at anything. And I, I think I see upwards of 70% of the time when I hear new Salesforce professionals or existing talking about work-life balance. Often the issue is them setting boundaries with their employers and being open to the fact if your employer is going to fire you for not working 80 hours a week, then why do you want to work there? Like that's also on you. Like you're choosing to work for a company. We have work choice, you know, as Salesforce professionals, we can apply for other jobs, especially once you have experience, you can, you know, go take your pick. And if your company works you 80 hours a week and you don't like that, then talk to them and find that balance. And if they're not open to it and they're not respecting your boundaries, then leave because people who don't respect your boundaries don't deserve your time. And that's just the reality of life, not just work. So yeah, set those boundaries. And I wanted to talk some about boundaries with community because community feels like that's where you shouldn't have boundaries. We don't talk about it as much, right? Like we, we talk about work boundaries. I should only work 40 hours a week and maybe 42 or three, but outside of my eight to five, like don't contact me. And that all sounds very logical and everyone's going to agree with you and give high fives and it's good to go. Now, what about community though? Because Salesforce is massively communal. And especially when you're building your brand on platforms like LinkedIn, you're putting yourself out there into the community. And when you join user groups and trailblazer community groups, and there's dream events and there's local meetups for your local cities, and there's people who need help and you want to mentor, especially once you become a professional, you want to help people who are behind you in this journey and you want to help reach a hand out and pull them forward. And there's speaking engagements for things like military trailblazer office hours or healthcare heroes, LinkedIn user groups, and all these groups 
that you can go spend on Salesforce Saturdays, virtual events, and all this other stuff. So you can do anything from mentoring to guest speaking, to speaking at live dream and events, to trying to get speaking spots at Dreamforce, to mentoring five different people and constantly keeping up with your DMs and your social media threads. I've had so many people in my DMs, probably in the last 30 days, I've spoken to either in person or in private messages, three to five different people. And over the last year, I would say it's 20 plus individuals I've talked to, and they wonder how they can balance getting all this stuff done. Because the reality is, like we were just saying, you've got your 40 hour work week or more, and then you've got your community where you're trying to engage on these different platforms. You're trying to do speaking events. Uh, you're trying to spend time with your family. If you have kids, you're trying to figure out you know, where they fit into your life. And that's unfortunate because we shouldn't be worried about where our kids fit into our life or where our spouses fit into our life or where our friends fit into our life. Those should come first and community should come second. And I know some people that may pique your interest and you go like, really? Community second? And yeah, because you have to have your home life dialed in. You have to have your work-life balance dialed in because if you don't, you can't really be there for your community the way that you could be otherwise. And when you look back 20 years from now, you know, your employer is not really going to remember all the times you worked overtime and you are going to have community people that you've impacted. And that's going to be amazing. But the people who are going to remember it the most are going to be your spouse and your kids and your parents and the people around you that you had limited time with that meant the most to you. And you know, if you're listening to this, you know, they meant the most to you. So we have to act like it and we have to find that balance that truly shows that they mean the most to us. And community is vitally important, but we have to find a role for it because it is infinite. It is infinite. There's always one more person you can help. There's always a hundred more people you can help. And I think it's really, you know, valiant that we spend our time helping people. And I love the community and helping people. And I've seen this firsthand with my own life. So that's why I know how important it is that we strike that balance and we create a role for helping community in our lives. And it can't just take over every square inch of time after our 40 hour work week. So the next time someone invites you to speak at an event or the next time you're feeling FOMO because you're not speaking at Dreamforce or you're not speaking at Midwest Dream and or whatever the next event is, take a step back, make sure this is something you actually want to do and it meets your goals and the goals you have for helping the community. And if it doesn't, then give yourself that opportunity to say no. And it gets really confusing because we have work and we're trying to establish balance at work, but we forget to establish balance in community. And community is incredible and we can give and give and give, but you can't give if you don't have anything left, right? Because we know how we operate when we're tired, when we're overwhelmed, when our spouses aren't happy with us, when our kids aren't getting the attention that they need, when our family and our friends, and we're losing our, our relationships that are outside of work because we're working our nine to five at Salesforce and our Salesforce careers. And then we're working our five to nine afterwards in the Salesforce community. And that's a beautiful thing, but you have to protect yourself. And so what I would say is just be thoughtful about what you're trying to accomplish. Helping one person is infinitely meaningful. That's infinitely meaningful. And you don't have to help everyone. So if you can mentor one person at a time and help them along, I can pretty well guarantee you're going to have time for that. You're going to have time to mentor that one person, maybe meeting with them 30 minutes to an hour a week for that coffee chat style and helping them along in their career and giving the guidance that you can. And that's incredibly meaningful to them and their family and their kids and their mental health and all those things that go into that. And you're also protecting your own mental health while giving back to someone in an incredibly meaningful way. And then you can move on to mentoring the next person. But think about what you're trying to accomplish. Like to me, it makes sense if you want to be a product creator, like a course creator, or you have an app on the app exchange, or you're effectively a business owner at that point. It makes sense to me that you want to speak at events and be engaged and talk about the topic that you want to talk about because you want to be known as the credible expert on the topic. But if that's not you, then think twice about the FOMO you're feeling when you see someone say, I'm a speaker at the blah, blah, blah. I'm going to be an opening keynote at the whatever event. You can feel your feelings, but don't let FOMO make you feel like you need to do that because we don't all need to do everything. We can do something very simple and make sure you appreciate the meaning that that simple thing has before you effectively sacrifice yourself for what at the end of the day is a corporate enterprise platform community. Like remember what you're serving and the people matter. But at the end of the day, this is a career-based professional community and you can get relationships and friends and 
you know, real meaningful things out of that. And you can help real people in a meaningful way, but just, I'll just, I could go for days, but protect yourself before you sacrifice yourself for the community. Yeah, well said. I mean, remember everyone listening here, you're pivoting into a sales force career to better yourself and your family. So just don't lose sight of that vision. I, I give you this advice, even though know, I'm like one of the people that like piles so much on top. Um, I learned my lesson. This last time was really bad. Like everything got busy all at the same time. I was like, oh, all right, I need to step back. So yes, thank you for saying all that. Definitely is something that needs to be heard. Yeah, it's part two of this. It's kind of like part of this decision to like practicing what we preach. It's part of this decision not to have an immediate season four to the show, right? Like, don't get us wrong. Like, I, I'll speak for myself. It's nice seeing people on social media say, oh, we love the show and that's amazing and thank you so much and you guys are so smart and you know all the things. Like, yeah, that feels good to, to get the pat on the back. And I think if you're not careful and if we weren't careful, then very quickly we could get sort of somewhat addicted to just let's create another episode to get another pat on the back because it's so nice to go to an event and say, I am the host of the Salesforce for Everyone podcast. And when, when you identify and you let it take up part of your identity, yeah, it can definitely overtake your life if you're not careful. That was awesome. I think that wraps it up for work hacks. Do you have any last minute ones you want to share? I mean, I think that's pretty much it. Obviously, stay tuned. We're very likely, if not definitely, going to do a future episode on GPT. We could talk about GPT as a work hack, but I think it deserves its own episode. We we talked, I think, about almost everything. Like I'm I'm amazed at how much we've covered. So I'm sure that there are going to be threads on LinkedIn and Facebook and everywhere else about you know, other people's work hacks. And we'll definitely post and, and ask you guys to share yours. But yeah, I think that's it. All right. For anyone still listening who has listened through all three seasons, still hasn't gone to the website, I'm going to share it one more time. If you want to start a career in Salesforce, head over to talentstacker.com forward slash start to try the free five day challenge. And as always, if you are getting value from this podcast, please subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on because you need to be subscribed now because it's, you're not getting an episode next Monday. So you got to be subscribed so you get that notification that lets you know we released a new episode because like we said at the beginning, future episodes are going to be vitally meaningful to the community. And we're going to make sure that they are topics that absolutely matter in addition to what we've already covered. So be sure to subscribe and leave us that five-star review if you don't mind. And until the next episode, bye. bye. Thank you for joining us today. To get started for free on your own Salesforce career, go to talentstacker.com forward slash start or check the show notes. There you'll find all the resources you need to start earning 60 to 80,000 in as little as eight months, no matter your education or career background. The Salesforce for Everyone podcast was produced by Edmund T and engineered by Andrew Mendonza. If you like what we do at this scrappy can-do podcast, please help others find us by leaving a five-star rating and a great review on whichever platform you're listening to us right now. See you next time.